Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the Future of UV EB Advanced Manufacturing Trends, Strategies, and Applications, a regular webinar series presented by the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in collaboration with RadTech International North America, the Association for UV and EB Technology. My name is Brandon Murphy, and I'll be your host today from SUNY ESF. Uh, as a quick reminder, all the webinars in this series are archived at esf.edu slash openacademy slash uvebwebinar, and you'll get a reminder about that uh, after the conclusion of this webinar as well. We also have a couple of uh, more RadTech webinars coming up here on uh, November 19th. Well, there's a webinar on the overview of current OSHA issues and TSCA-related hot topics. Uh, a companion webinar to today's webinar of, of UV LED for wide web and flexible packaging. And then on breaking news, Nick, Mickey hasn't uh, sent this one out yet, but beyond coding and cure, the fine points of applying UV curable materials in your manufacturing process will be on December 10th. Uh, so look for an email regarding that particular webinar soon. Uh, as a reminder, RadTech and ESF invite you to expand your knowledge. ESF offers an online graduate certificate in radiation curing chemistry. And also the RadTech 2020 uh, conference is coming right up in March. It's going to be March 9th through 11th uh, at the Disney Coronado Springs Resort in Orlando. Nice time to, to be in Orlando. I'm coming, I'm presenting today from Syracuse and it is currently snowing outside. Um, you can get more information at radtech2020.com or the RadTech main website, um, radtech.org. I believe there's still some slots available, too, if you are interested in exhibiting there. Um, and then for other registration information, just check out the RadTech 2020 uh, website. Just a quick logistics for today, a little housekeeping. So if you're, if you've not been on one of the RadTech webinars before, it's got, as a, you're, it's listen only, so we will take questions at the end via a, a chat window. Um, but if you're joining us, uh, and even if you're joining us by phone, your line will be muted. And so with that being said, today's webinar on UV LED for, in narrow web is being presented by Jennifer Heathcote of Eminence UV and Jake Staples of Ashland. Jennifer has been in the UV equipment and applications business since 1998. She is a technical and commercial advisor with Eminence UV and is considered a leading authority on both conventional UV and UV LED technology, as well as their use across a broad range of graphic and industrial curing applications. Jennifer earned her uh, Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering, in Engineering from Purdue University and her MBA from the Fisher College of Business at uh, Ohio State University. Jake Staples is a technical team leader for Ashland, specializes in radiation curable coatings, primers, and adhesives, and has over 17 years of energy curable expertise, particularly within the development of UV LED technologies. His roles include product development and technical service. He has presented at industry conferences and co-authored three articles in trade journals. He holds a Bachelor's in Arts in Physics from Carthage College and a Master of Science in Mechanical Energy. Uh, engineering from the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer and Jake. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. So first of all, I want to thank uh, SUNY ESF and RadTech for hosting this webinar series. Um, but I also want to give a special thank you to uh, Danny Dealman from the Flexible Packaging Association, who sent word of this webinar out to the FCA members, as well as Rosalind um, Bandy from the Tag and Label Manufacturers Institute who sent um, information of the webinar out to TLMI members. So if you're joining us from FPA or TLMI, uh, welcome. And if you're joining us from RadTech, uh, we welcome you as, as well. Uh, much of the presentations that have been done on UVLHD technology for, for narrow web have really focused on, on ink. And so what, what Ashland and I thought um, that we would do is put together um, a webinar that would kind of give an overview of the state of narrow web flexo with, with a focus on, on coatings and adhesives. So there'll be a few comments kind of mixed in throughout on inks, 
but we're really going to focus um, a lot on coatings and adhesives. So we will start with, I'll, I'll begin, uh, we've got about 30 slides split equally between the two of us. Um, I'm going to give an, an, a state of the, the market for narrow web flexo, and I'll also talk about some recent advancements in UVLE curing systems. Uh, Jake will come in and talk about uh, coatings and adhesives, migration, sustainability, uh, and applications, and then I'll come back in at the end to kind of talk about how to advance development in additional areas. So where are we today? Um, if you consider the first showcase of UV LED on a narrow web press uh, was at Label Expo in 2009. Um, it wasn't meant to be a commercial for sale press. It was just to start introducing the industry to the technology. Um, the next evolution in that was in 2012 when Mark Andy came out with it, its ProLED system, which was a partnership with, with Fosion and, and Flint in 2012. And that introduction started the um, actual purchase of LED technology in the market. And so now fast forward to 2019, um, where are we at? Well, all of the major conventional UV system vendors that have always sold conventional mercury lamps are now offering either dedicated LED or a hybrid LED system. A hybrid LED is, is one where you can swap the cassette back and forth between a conventional mercury and an LED. So everybody's got a solution, whether it's dedicated um, or hybrid. Almost all the formulation vendors are offering either LED formulations or dual cure formulations. Conventional inks, coatings, and adhesives that were formulated for mercury do not cure with LED. So initially, formulators start by coming up with a solution that will cure with LED, but not with mercury. The next step is dual cure, which again is formulated for LED, but is backward compatible uh, with mercury. And that seems to be the direction that most formulators in this industry are going. All of your major narrow web press OEMs are offering UV LED. They promote it uh, to different degrees, but if you're interested in a narrow web press from an LED supply with an LED equipment on it, uh, those OEMs are capable of providing that. And we're probably at a state where about 10 to 15 percent of the new presses are, are being sold with dedicated LED. Um, it's, it's a smaller number than most of us the suppliers in the industry would like, um, but it, it is growing. There's probably um, at least 300 and probably quite a bit more of narrow web presses in the industry that have LED capability. It's getting harder um, to kind of come up with a, a good number as more and more vendors enter this market space. Um, with respect to mid and wide web, it's, it's easily over 15, and that represents about a, more than 2,000 total LED stations. You know, presses can be equipped um, with multiple carrying stations, and you may have one LED system on there to cure a white ink or maybe a heavily pigmented black ink, or you may equip the entire press, you know, all 8, 10, 12 stations with LED. Um, there's also about 13,000 hybrid power supplies that have been installed on presses uh, globally. Now, while many of those may be, may be using arc lamps today, um, they could be uh, quickly converted to LED for those converters who want to make the switch. We've really seen growth kind of concentrated in North America, but it's, it's growing globally. There's a lot of activity in, in Europe, um, as well as some growing activity in Asia and, and South America. And we really have about more than six years of converter use and data points, and we're learning where the technology makes sense and, and where we need to focus a little bit more development. I love this chart. This has been <laughs> my chart of 2019. I have to come up with a new one for 2020, but I've used this everywhere because I think it really captures where we're at on LED technology. If you Look at the y-axis, which is the pace and value of innovation over time, which is the x-axis. This flat, slowly increasing purple curve that, or line that goes off to the right, that represents conventional technology, mercury arc lamps. Every year or every couple years, new features and benefits come out. They get a little more efficient. They get a little bit better. But that improvement, that innovation is really incremental. When you introduce new technology, which is this green curve, in the early days, 
most people do not have a reference point to really understand what that new technology offers. In this case, it's LED technology. So in the early days, when you don't have that reference point, you don't quite understand it. All you can do is compare it to what you know, and in this case, it's mercury arc lamps. And so everything that a mercury arc lamp does, anyone who wants to adopt LED expects LED to do absolutely everything that mercury does. And that's just not the case. With new technology, it's not the same thing. So it's always easy to find something where the mercury is going to outperform LED. And that happens for a period of time until you get to the point where we figured everything out, and now LED technology is pretty much comparable to mercury. And at that point, we have a better reference point, and we can really utilize all the benefits that technology offers much more effectively. And when that happens, it turns into exponential growth, and the two lines really diverge. And that's when LED technology takes off and leaves you know, conventional mercury lamps in the dust. It also starts to create disruptive stress and opportunity that allow us to do things with the technology that we can't with mercury lamps. And that's really what the true value of LED offers. And in some cases, there are some customers that have started to realize that because they're familiarizing themselves with LED and figuring out the things they can do with that technology that you can't with, with mercury. Now, the challenge we have at the moment is everyone who's selling formulations, LED equipment, presses, they see the market kind of in this blue circle. In other words, we feel we've crossed that halfway point, and we want everyone to start converting and ramping up use. Problem is, is most converters are still over here on the left side of the curve, and they're a little bit hesitant, a little bit fearful. They're still comparing LED to mercury and, and making their list of things where mercury still outperforms. In the middle, you have this small overlap of the two curves. These are the converters that are actually adopting LED today. These are the converters that know that mercury and LED aren't the same, and there may be a few things where mercury is still better today. But they've bought into all of the promise that the LED technology offers and are willing to work around those few things that maybe aren't quite there so that they can learn and be ahead of the curve when the technology starts to advance and turn into economic or uh, exponential growth. So what are those benefits um, that, are, that are emphasized by all the suppliers? Well, first of all, UV LED technology has no infrared output, uh, which means less heat to the transfer to the substrate. There's still heat energy. UV light is still energy. So you're still going to heat up your substrate a little bit. You're still going to heat up the formulation. It's an exothermic reaction. It's just a fraction of the heat transfer that you would get with conventional UV. It's solid state technology, which means it's instant on, instant off. There's no shutters. There's no warm up and cool down cycle time. You get much greater irradiance, so that brightness, that intensity, um, that longer UVA wavelength. That allows UV LED technology to cure inks much better than mercury. That longer wavelength, that high concentration uh, is great for, for white inks, black inks, heavily pigmented inks, metallic inks. That's where LEDs really found its success over the last you know, six years, because those are classic cases where LED outperforms mercury. There's no ozone. Because we're only in that UVA, that longer UVA wavelength, um, you can only create ozone below 240 nanometers. And because the light is not emitting anywhere near that UVC short wavelength, there's no ozone generation, which means you don't need exhaust ducting and you don't need uh, conditioned makeup air to replace the air that you're removing from the facility. No mercury in the bulbs means it's environmentally safer. Uh, you've got longer lifetimes with no bulb changes, and then greater reliability and reduced maintenance compared to conventional UV, which translates into more uptime and greater yield. So when we're swapping technology, again, we expect it to do more than just the same thing. And where LED is really going to help is in uh, operational efficiencies. You should be able to get better product off your press. You should be able to get um, faster speeds, greater yields. Uh, the operators generally enjoy working with the technology because it becomes one aspect of the press that they don't have to worry about, that they don't have to think about, and they can just focus on some things that require more of their attention. So with all those great benefits, 
why hasn't the market switched in mass? If we're only selling 10, 15, 15% of presses, new presses with LED, what is it that's delaying adoption by that other 85, 90% of the market? Well, first of all, technology alone is not enough to drive change. There's always some unknown risk, and that can be real risk or it could be perceived risk. In any case, when we're not familiar with new technology, there's some risk that exists that we associate with making and navigating that technical, technological change. And until the benefits are outweigh that risk of change, companies are more likely to stay with what they're familiar with, which is mercury technology. The second challenge is that the true value of LED technology varies by application and installation. I mean, there are hundreds and thousands of different ways UV curing is used uh, on a printing press. And when we give presentations, we're often limited to a half an hour or an hour. If you invite us into your facility, you know, we might get a half an hour or an hour. And it's hard to delve into all those different variations um, with a specificity to give people the confidence to switch. So we talk in general terms. And general terms, unfortunately, are not enough to convince people that the technology is the right solution. So if we think about that first bullet point, talking about risk, as long as the risk of change outweighs the benefits and features, and this applies to all technology across all markets, there's this hesitancy to switch. You know, risk is a, it's an emotional fear, and when you've got a binary purchasing decision between mercury and LED, it's easy to stick with what's comfortable. You know, you don't want to get yourself in a situation where you can't run product, and that's what's weighing on converters' minds. And uncertainty always favors the incumbent technology. So here's this dichotomy. You've got suppliers that believe in the technology. We've got lots of cases where the technology is working and proving to be better than mercury, but the market's just not shifting. And if we look at the applications, um, the, if we can't help you show that there's a quantifiable impact to your bottom line, your overall process, there's really no, no incentive to switch. And so you opt for safety, as I've mentioned before, and you stick with what you know. And you'll explore the, tech, the new technology, you explore LED by joining webinars. I mean, we had well over 160 people registered for the webinar today. So that shows that there's interest in the technology. That shows that people know it's coming. But there's this, this question of when do we switch? And so what Jake and I are trying to do today is maybe talk a little bit more about coatings and adhesives, because that's where a lot of the the concern lies. I think people believe um, that it works great for ink, it works great at slower speeds, but what we can do, what can we do when we look at coatings, what can we look do at adhesives, and what do we do when those press speeds increase? So what are those fears? When I, when I talk to converters and I ask them, you know, well, why aren't you switching, or what's the hesitation? Probably the number one fear that comes back is that they believe that you will be unable to run a portion of your job. If you only have a couple of presses in your plant, you need to make sure that you can run your jobs on those presses. And if you swap out technology that means you can't run some things, it makes it a little bit harder in your planning. And then to go even a little bit further, you know there's jobs you can't run, but you're not even sure what those jobs are. And if you're running a lot of products for big brands where you've had to certify and qualify um, the equipment and the technology, if you switch the light source and if you switch the chemistry, you may have to requalify those. And, and if you're a house that runs lots of qualified jobs, you know, that's, that's time consuming. And then and that's a fear. Um, if you don't feel you have enough information to make an educated decision, or that you might make the wrong decision, you know, that plays on that indecisiveness and, and keeps us with the incumbent technology. There's always time um, needed to learn, develop, and train staff. And at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're getting at least the same cure as you would with mercury and hopefully better cure. You want to be able to run at least as fast as you did with mercury, if not better. And what do you do if you have to replace the lamp? Um, LED, LED technology is definitely longer life. It's lower maintenance, but it's not no maintenance. And as all manufactured you know, products and technology have in common is that there comes a time when you have to replace it. And finally, you know, one of the fears that we hear a lot is that you know, people always want to make a decision with an ROI. You know, they want that 
reassurance that financially they're making the right decision. And most people don't have the information to properly calculate that ROI. And even if they do, they're afraid that maybe the numbers aren't quite right, and at the end of the day, that ROI is never going to materialize. So let's take a look about some of the variables that affect the significance of an ROI. Well, first of all, the LED systems that are available on the market are not all the same. And the way the marketing brochures are presented and the way um, presentations are conducted, when, they, when suppliers focus on just benefits, they all sound the same. And most of the key features that the LED suppliers are touting, it makes it sound like all the equipment is the same, and they're not. And so the one point that we don't really look at, that you really need to look at when you're talking to suppliers, is what's the wattage that's powering each of the individual LED heads? Because at the end of the day, wattage is power. And if the LED diodes in each of the systems are relatively at the same efficiency, certainly you can make things worse by designing a poor lamp head. But if we at least assume, and it's a big assumption, but let's assume that the efficiency of all these LED lamp heads are similar, then the big difference between all of them is the wattage going into the lamp, because that translates into UV power coming out. If you're a converter who runs less than 300 feet per minute, you don't need that powerful of an LED system. But if you're running over 600 feet a minute or 1,000 feet a minute, you need more power. You need more total energy. So the ROI for those conditions are going to be drastically different. If I put a powerful lamp on a slow speed press, it skews my ROI. And if I put a lamp that's not powerful enough on a high speed press, I'm never going to meet my speed targets and my ROI falls apart. So it's important to look past just the brand of the company that's selling the lamp and the specs um, that everybody seems to communicate that all sound the same. You need to look at the wattage of the individual lamps. Reliability and robustness. Um, the better made lamps will last longer. Um, you know, price, when we don't understand technology, we often use price to correlate with, with quality. Um, and just as you have a, a smartphone, you know, a better smartphone is going to last longer because it's sealed and it's robustly made. An LED system is a piece of electronics, and the ones that are made more robust, the ones that are properly sealed, um, are going to give you better life, which is going to positively affect that ROI. And then the ability to access and remove the LED head from the press affects the maintenance. LED systems are low maintenance. They're not no maintenance. And it doesn't make sense to spend $50,000, $100,000, or a couple hundred thousand dollars on new LED systems and then go cheap on a bracket because if your maintenance guys can't access those lamps and remove them from the press, they're never going to do so. And if you get ink that gets coated on the front of the lamp, that's going to decrease the UV output that reaches your substrate. So making sure that the integration is done properly, um, making sure that you can get access to the lamp is, is incredibly important. And then the system reliability, your uptime, your reduced maintenance, uh, eliminating condition makeup errors, those are really some of the biggest contributors to a positive ROI. And a lot of times those get left off of, of the calculation because they're hard sometimes to, to quantify. Energy savings is not always a significant driver. I think for, for slower speed applications, if you're running 100 feet a minute or 200 feet a minute, I think the ROI is incredibly attractive if you've got the right lamp. Um, when you get to very high-speed applications that need a lot of power, uh, LED is generally uh, better at energy savings than a mercury lamp, but it, it, it's much closer. They're much more comparable, especially for high-powered liquid-cooled systems. And then finally, if you remember that, that chart I showed about innovation, um, those disruptive stresses that increase value of innovation opportunities are very hard to value because we're not using them yet. So how do you put a value in your ROA for opportunities that can't be utilized until you dive into the technology? So advancements in LED technology. Well, it's a piece of electronics. And as all electronics get better over time, UV LED systems are getting more efficient. They're getting more reliable. They're getting more powerful. They're available in more form factors. Um, they've got increased uh, emitting area, which means more energy for your faster 
feed applications. We've got hybrid solutions. We have dedicated solutions. We can cool them with air. We can cool them with liquid. And we're getting better about designing the LAMP technology for a narrow web product because it looks like it's meant to be installed in a narrow web product. Uh, UVC LED technology um, is still in its infancy. We've got prototypes being tested. You're not going to see this anytime soon. We're probably three, five, or so even more years away from it, but it's coming. Um, as UVA gets better, UVC gets better, and then collectively we'll have lamps that incorporate both technologies. And certainly there's more vendors. Every trade show, there's always more people touting formulations, touting systems, touting presses, which gives you more choices. It may confuse you a bit because now you've got more information to wade through, um, but certainly more information is, is often better than less. So if we look at hybrid versus dedicated, um, the lamp on the left is the hybrid solution from GEW, and the lamp on the right is the hybrid solution um, from, from IST. The, a hybrid lamp is designed with a single housing and a single power and control system that allows you to swap out the cassette when needed. So if we look at um, this lamp on the left, the gray or the silver one is your arc lamp, and the one with the purple face is the LED. And this cassette here is designed to slide into this housing and run off the same power supply. Um, this is a liquid-cooled LED system and an air-cooled arc system. The IST system is both air-cooled for LED and, and arc. And then if we look at cooling, um, you can cool LED technology with either air or liquid. Um, if the cooling is designed properly, they're not always designed properly. Um, LEDs are a piece of electronics, much like your smartphone, your laptop, your flat screen TV. Any piece of solid state electronics um, is generating heat as it runs. The more powerful the system, the more heat that it generates. You can blow air across a heat sink. In this case, we've got Pull my, in this case, we have, oops, I've lost my arrow. Let's see. Oh, my arrow doesn't want to move, so I will leave that off for now. On the air-cooled system, we've got a heat sink at the bottom that draws the heat away from the diodes, and we've got cooling fans or fins that rise vertically, and the air blows across them to remove that heat. On a liquid-cooled system, we have a heat sink that's connected to a liquid-cooled manifold, and we're actually running water through that manifold to remove those heat. Um, liquid-cooled systems are more compact. Air-cooled systems are a little bit bigger and require clearances for that airflow. Um, the air coming off of an air-cooled system is, can be quite warm, so it depends on your environment whether you then choose to move that air and duct it away from the operator or, or the press. Uh, energy efficiencies are much better with air cooled systems than they are with LED systems, but you are dumping that heat into your plant. Um, if we look at all the vendors today, I just pull, pulled six from the industry as I read left to right. You've got GEW, you've got Fosion, you've got Cool UV, uh, which is a supplier out of Asia. Across the bottom, you've got Fujifilm, you've got AMS Spectral, and you've got IST. Uh, the designs are kind of coming to be more similar to each other. There's that matrix-style LED um, segment that gets installed or module that gets installed in the system. Um, they're all starting to get more and more similar in terms of form factor and, and size and, and, and output. With that, I will turn it over to Jake and let him talk about coatings and adhesives. All right, thank you. So this chart should be familiar to many people. Um, the Solid blocks are the mercury lamp. The, uh, the peaks are the UV LED. Um, but it's important to point out that LED is very different than mercury in the energy that it produces. Um, the intensity of the energy is much higher, but it's a much narrower wavelength. Um, and then you have the, OK, curse isn't. Delayed reaction there. You have different peaks depending on the wavelength. 395 is the most common. Um, there are some 365s in the market as well as 385 and 405. And it's important to have a system that's designed for the wavelength you're dealing with. Um, now where that those wavelengths factor in, 
is the where it cures within a ink coating or adhesive uh, layer. The UVC cures very well at the surface. And the O2 there is for the action, and action inhibits cure. UVC is good at cutting through the action inhibition and giving good surface cure. UVB cures partway into the system. UVA and UV visible have good penetration depth, but they do not work well in the presence of oxygen. The UV LED systems are all UVA, so you lost the UVC ability to cure at the surface. I'm going to a little history of where the UV LED coatings and adhesives started. Uh, these, as I mentioned, with the uh, no UVC wavelengths, it was more difficult to get uh, good surface cure due to uh, overcoming oxygen emission. And that resulted in a number of issues with the first generation of UV LED coatings and adhesives. Uh, there was a limited selection of photo initiators. They frequently had yellowing. Uh, Cure speeds were slow. Uh, there's a greasy surface for the coatings, which is due to the uh, lack of uh, good surface cure from oxygen emission. They're expensive, and they were not dual cure. So if you try to cure them by with mercury lamps, uh, the performance was not ideal. But there have been many advancements in the formulation uh, since those early days. And part of that comes from blending multiple photo initiators into packages that form synergies, which does allow for good surface cure, even with just UVA wavelengths at 395 nanometers. Um, monomer and oligomer selection is also beneficial to help boost the cure speeds. Um, one of the aspects of LED is that it does not cure the same as mercury UV does. So some of the monomers and oligomers that work well for mercury UV do not work as well for LED and vice versa. By choosing the right uh, selection of photo initiators, monomers and oligomers, that can uh, drive reactions faster. And today, there are UV LED coatings that offer hard surface cure with no greasy feel. Uh, very minimal yellowing at 600 feet per minute cure speeds. And by minimal, I refer to it as uh, not visible to the naked eye at flexo coat weights. Uh, there are non-yellowing formulas that cure a little bit slower, around 400 feet per minute. Uh, this allows for higher coat weight coatings, uh, such as embossed image. And the formulas can be UV LED and mercury UV dual cure. So you have one, uh, one coating that can function under both curing lamps. Um, on a similar note, primers are, have some similarities to coatings, but they do offer a little bit different. Um, primers typically do not need to have a hard surface cure, so they can have a soft cure, but non-greasy feel is still important. Um, due to that softness, they have uh, a little bit slower cure speeds, 300 feet per minute with minimal yellowing, 200 feet per minute for higher coat weights, and these are also UV LED and mercury UV dual cure. Um, for the advancements in UV LED adhesives, uh, these adhesives are not affected by oxygen emission. So the um, have an easier time getting good cure. The cure speeds can be equal to or greater than mercury UV formulations. They provide uh, adhesive bond performance as good as mercury UV formulations. You have many non-yellowing options available, and they cure through polypropylene, polyethylene, and polyester. Um, polyester blocks a lot of the shorter wavelength UV, but the UV LED is concentrated in the UVA range, which provides good uh, penetration through that uh, film. UV LED pressure sensitive adhesives are also available. Uh, they are effective by oxygen emission, but less so than coatings. Cure speeds are equivalent to mercury UV formulations. They offer adhesive bond performance equal to uh, mercury UV formulations, and there are non-yellowing options available here as well. 
Um, on this slide, I wanted to point out uh, some of the, the truths about UVLED curing on press. Um, one of the aspects of UVLED is that the photo initiators that are necessary to get UVLED coatings and pressure sensitive adhesives to cure in the, the absence of UVC or UVB allow them to cure really well uh, with a mercury system under a dual cure nature. Um, you will see that uh, LED inks uh, do run faster with LED than by mercury, um, but they don't need a hard surface cure. They are usually protected by varnish or laminate, and the longer UV LED wavelengths provide better uh, penetration depth, especially with whites, blacks, and metallics. Um, LAM adhesives are another area that benefits from LED, um, again, depending on the formulation and application and they can run as fast or faster with LED than mercury. Um, this is for a dual cure system. Uh, LED pressure sensitive adhesives will cure faster if you put them under mercury uh, than they would under an LED system. The aspect of this too though is that uh, typical flexo PSAs have a max cure speed of around 250 feet per minute. Um, above that they start misting on press and LED flexo PSAs typically run 100 to 300 feet per minute uh, with mercury or LED based on the design of the pressure sense adhesive and the chemistry. LED varnishes, uh, both gloss and matte, will cure faster if placed under a mercury lamp than they would by LED. Um, again, it just goes back to the fact that once you add a little bit of UVC and UVB wavelengths, those photo initiators that are necessary to get good surface cure with UVA alone will cure much faster under mercury. Um, that being said, though, the LED varnishes will cure equivalent to a comparable mercury varnish that's cured by a mercury lamp. So we have LED varnishes available today that provide comparable speed, but if those same LED varnishes are placed under a mercury system, uh, they will cure faster. And it's a matter of understanding your press and your light sources in order to have the correct speeds necessary. Um, on this slide, I want to go into some of the sustainability uh, advantages of LED. Um, the elimination of the infrared uh, light output is beneficial in, in heat management. There, as Jennifer mentioned, there's no mercury uh, in the LED systems, which is beneficial uh, based on a number of uh, potential regulations that are looking at uh, getting rid of or at least reducing mercury use. Uh, there is no ozone generation by LED based on the wavelength, so you don't have to worry about that venting the ozone out of a plant atmosphere. Um, one of the aspects of LED that is also part of uh, mercury V is low to near zero VOCs. And uh, most radiation curable systems are effectively zero VOCs, but it depends on how they are, that number is calculated. Uh, in some cases, uh, some of the calculations that are used could come out at very low percentages. But in any case, uh, VOCs are not an issue with any energy curable system, and that includes UV LED. Um, also benefit is the instant cure provided by uh, the energy curable systems. And UV LED has uh, the, the same aspect where you could take a product off your press, um, a flexible package, slit, form, and fill the same day, uh, which is not capable of other chemistries. Um, UV LED energy is very consistent in the output, which is a benefit when you're working on projects such as a, uh, a flexible package or some other low migration uh, aspect, or even just a matter of controlling your press variables. Uh, you, with a mercury bulb, the energy output decreases from the moment you turn it on, and after, over time, 
uh, you have to either adjust your press speed or maintain your uh, bib maintenance on the press in order to have consistent output each time and get the same performance from the coating or adhesive. LED takes a lot of the variables out. You don't have to worry about reflectors. Your uh, output is very consistent from the LED diodes compared to a, a mercury bulb. And that provides a lot of uh, consistency for the, the uh, operators. And then lastly, there's the energy savings. UV LED tends to have less energy requirements than other chemistries or even mercury lamps. Uh, mercury, you're putting a lot of your energy into visible light and heat, which are really wasted uh, aspects of your, your process. They aren't necessary, and in some cases, they're actually undesirable. And LED removes a lot of that and focuses the energy in the very narrow UVA band. There have also been a lot of advancements in mole migration for LED. Uh, I'm not going to go over all the, the bullet points in this page, but this represents some migration testing that was conducted for UV LED lamp adhesives for a flexible packaging application. And based on the testing, we found a few different conditions where we were able to have safe levels of migration for the, the package, and it's uh, fairly significant. These were done with um, different types of food simulants, different press speeds, and uh, thicknesses of the uh, barrier film. Moving on to different applications where UV LED uh, can work. The, at this point, the chemistry and the technology has reached the state where most applications can be done that previously were done by mercury can also be done by UV LED. And that includes uh, overprint varnishes, different types of functional coatings, such as uh, product resistant or water resistant coatings, primers, lamy adhesives, as well as PSAs. Um, cold foil adhesives are an area that benefits very well from LED because you've got better penetration depth through the foil. And the lack of oxygen makes it a natural fit. Casting cure is another good area, because while you're dealing with coatings, you, the film has eliminated the oxygen layer, which boosts the ability of the LED coating to cure. Um, embossing with the thicker non-yellowing coatings. LED is good for heat sensitive films, including shrink sleeves, where the energy from the heat from a mercury UV lamp is challenging to get a good cure without prematurely shrinking your films. On this slide, I go over a couple of different uh, coating method types. We've got the, uh, the Flexo printing and coating method with a UV LED lamp curing after the application. And then this shows a different uh, process, a different location of the LED. And part of the point here is the amount of working distance. So depending on the working distance to your surface um, will determine what type of power you need for your LED lamp. Um, LEDs lose intensity quite significantly as you increase the working distance. So it's important to understand the, the peak irradiance that you need to start with and work with your equip, LED equipment manufacturers to identify if different types of optics are needed in order to improve the intensity at the surface. Um, with LED coatings and adhesives, there's a, a minimum peak irradiance that is needed to start the reaction. And once you get past that point, adding more energy 
or uh, it's commonly called dose, will boost your cure speed. And here we have a typical uh, UV LED lamy adhesive application, um, followed by a pressure sensitive type. So you've got a, a wet lamb on the left and a dry lamb on the right. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jennifer. Thanks, Jake. Um, so when we talk about new development, it, it's important to keep in mind that new technologies never address a seamless replacement for mature technology. And in most markets, you know, a lot of converters are waiting for that point. When, when you attend the trade shows and the conferences and you speak with your vendors, there's a good bulk of the industry that's just not willing to shift. And so LED can do absolutely everything um, that mercury can do. And, you know, Jake went through all the different variations on, on coatings and adhesives that I think a, a bulk of the market still, still believes we can't do. And, and that's just not the case. For those of you that are curing at slow speed, LED technology is viable for just about everything that you want to do. There may be some isolated cases, and you should certainly talk to your vendors about that. But we're not in this, well, let's just wait and see environment. I mean, it, it is viable. It's viable for ink. It's viable for coatings and all of the long list of applications that Jake went through. So what we need to do is spend time, you know, exploring this area to the left and learn the technology because we really are very close, if not on top of this dotted line. There are a few things that still need some work, but if you're not at least investigating LED, you're going to get left behind by some of the competitors out there that are actually shifting to LED. There isn't anybody who's made the switch to LED that is saying, I'm going to go back to mercury. And that's a pretty big testimonial. So how do we drive development? Well, first, it's important to start by understanding where LED is a better fit than mercury. Where does it outperform all the time? Well, that's ink, especially whites, blacks, metallics, anything that's heavily pigmented. LED will outperform mercury. In laminating and cold foil adhesives, LED outperforms mercury. You get better cure, you get better yields, you get better speed. And then you start to look at where is LED comparable to mercury? Well, that's in varnishes, both gloss and matte, primers, pressure sensitive adhesives. You can get comparable performance with an LED lamp and LED formulated chemistry in these, in these areas. And then finally, for those few applications where maybe LED is just not quite there yet, it's important to collaborate with suppliers. And that includes the LED system supplier, the formulation supplier, the press OEM, and some of those areas include, you know, low migration adhesion of ink, um, some really high functional coatings like silicon release or high COF. Applications may be in medical or for premium brands where you absolutely can have no yellowing. Um, most of the work that, that Jake's done um, and his colleagues have done has, has been to eliminate that yellowing. And, and, and most of it is acceptable for most applications. But there's always a few things where you need 100% yellowing, elimination of yellowing. And then always, everybody always wants faster speeds. Even if they're not going to run faster, everyone always wants to know they can run faster. And we've gotten coatings to speeds that people thought we'd never be able to do, you know, just two or three years ago. And so they'll continue to get better. And then certainly matching the LED systems, matching them to the press. You've got lots of choices. If you've got a slow speed press, you have a ton of options. If you've got a high speed press, those options aren't as great, but you still have choices. And so it's important to talk to your vendors and figure out what makes sense for you. So a final graphic, just to kind of highlight that in pictorial form. Um, the first step is education. It's listening and attending webinars. It's attending conferences. It's calling your vendors, your suppliers, asking the questions asking the questions so that you feel comfortable enough with the information that, that you're getting. Once you proceed past a baseline understanding of the technology, then it's a collaboration stage. You really need to go through your formulations um, at a pretty, you know, pre in pretty great depth to figure out of everything that you run, what works with LED and what maybe are the few areas where you might need to run that on a separate press or use a hybrid system where you can go back and forth. Then you conduct press trials. 
you know, you want to run the formulations, the LED formulations with the LED lamps that you're intending to purchase on the press and in the environment that you want to do. And that can be done um, at a customer demo center. That may be at a, a press OEM. You know, it could be at an educational center, such as the Sonoco Institute. Um, it can be at a formulator. Um, there's lots of places where you can run press trials, including on your own press. There are lots of loaner lamps out there that can be supplied to you uh, to run testing um, at, your, at your facility. The next step is once you run those press trials, there's got to be some feedback, feedback. All of us have been on trials, and they very rarely go off seamlessly that first time around. We're always learning. Either it's a tweak to the formulation, a tweak to the lamp, a tweak to the setup, or a tweak to the press. You've got to continue that dialogue with all the suppliers so we can figure out what adjustments we need to make. And the beauty is, is that once we figure that out, you lock it in. You lock it in and it's repeatable. So then you can move towards integration. You know, you, once you have your, your vendors selected, you've got the confidence that it works, then you can work closely with either um, the LED lamp supplier or the press supplier, whoever's going to do that integration to make sure that that lamp is accessible and it's in the right location to do what you need. And then finally, you run product. And even when you get to that state where you're running solid product, the education never stops. You've got to continue working throughout the supply chain to figure out how do we make those processes even better? How do we further improve sustainability? How do we start developing those innovative UV LED curable applications that we can't do with mercury today? So in conclusion, this is the last slide and then we'll open up for questions. UV LED technology is viable for narrow web curing, particularly on the slower speed presses and on many of the faster speed presses. There are a few things that still work better with mercury or can't be done with LED, but that list is getting much smaller. UV LED provides converters and brands with green and sustainable curing. If any of you are attending conferences, all anybody's talking about is sustainability. The consumers, the end consumers, the brands, everybody is pushing on production and manufacturing facilities to implement green, sustainable uh, production processes. LED gets us going down that sustainability route. And as we get more and more vendors introduced to the market, you've got more options. Everybody likes options. It keeps vendors and competitors honest, and it gives you more choices. But it's up to you. It's up to converters. It's up to everyone in the supply chain to engage and understand the differences in all the LED product offerings. They're, they're not the same. And so you have to work closely with everyone um, to, stay on, to stay on top of things. And then it becomes, you know, it comes down to an individual decision. Where does LED make financial and operational sense for your business? Every situation is different. There are lots of applications and converter setups where LED makes complete sense today, and there's others that maybe there's a little bit more work to do. But you've got to make that decision for yourself, and the vendors are here to, here to help. So engage with those vendors across the supply chain. And right now, those vendors, whether it's the formulator, the LED supplier, the press OEM, they're working in the areas where converters are asking them to work, where they're telling them to work. So if you're not voicing to them your interest, you may not be getting the attention that maybe some of your competitors are receiving. And it's important to start integrating LED systems on the presses. You know, that could be a single station. That can be an entire dedicated LED press. It can be a hybrid solution. Uh, you can retrofit presses in your facility that maybe have excess capacity and start to learn and run, um, run jobs in those presses so that you get more familiar with the technology. And engage with the LED technology to identify what those potential disruptive stresses are going to be. They're coming, and we're getting closer and closer and closer. And LED is where this industry is headed. So it's important to understand, as we did today, where does it work for coatings and adhesives? And as we get more familiar with that, we're going to start to develop and become very innovative and be able to do things in, in packaging and labels that we haven't been able to do with mercury. So, you know, with that, Jake and I want, we've got about maybe five or seven minutes here left to open the floor up to questions. Um, if anybody has, if anybody's still on the line and wants to 
propose something that they'd hope to hear that, that we didn't necessarily cover. Thank you, Jennifer and Jake. So if you have any questions, you can uh, type them into the Q&A window, and uh, Jennifer and Jake will answer them. All right, there's one question here. Um, can you touch on the formulation price differences between LED and mercury formulation? Um, so generally right now, the, the price between a, a LAM adhesive that's designed for mercury versus an LED LAM adhesive, they're, they're fairly comparable. There may be a small premium for LED depending on the application, but it's not a significant price difference. For uh, coatings and pressure sensitive adhesives and primers, there is a premium. Um, generally, it's about uh, approximately 25% higher than a comparable uh, benzophenone free coating. And, and I stress that piece because uh, it's not really not fair to compare LED to benzophenone because uh, benzophenone is the cheapest coating share in the market, and most people are moving away from it, and all LED formulations are benzophenone free. Uh, there's another question about how does line thickness affect curing? Um, that does depend on the application and design, how it's formulated and designed. So if the application is designed well, um, the, it should cure comparable to a mercury system for that uh, coating thickness, but it really depends on if the LED, uh, how it was formulated, and for that I recommend that you work with a uh, supplier of LED coatings in order, or adhesives depending on the application in order to uh, find out the best solution. There's another question about are there, yeah, are there cases Go when ahead, both Jennifer. traditional, are there cases when when both uh, traditional and LED make sense? Uh, certainly, there's always going to be some functional coatings today, where as Jake said, you're going to get better cure and faster speed um, with a combination of LED and mercury. So what that means that comes down to how you run. If you're running slow speed, you can probably get away with 100% LED. If you've got very demanding functional coatings that are still proving to be a bit better with mercury, then you might keep mercury on that last station. Um, because mercury adds some UVC and UVB that you don't get with LED, which is strictly UVA, um, the chemistry is going to respond to those shorter wavelengths. Now, do you need to use both mercury and LED? Not always. In most cases, you don't. But there are isolated instances, particularly with functional coatings and 100% non-yellowing, where you will get better performance. Do you want to answer the one about PI, Jake? Sure. Um, this question here, there's not much PI available for LED. Any thought about PI for LED? Um, that's a little outside my area. I'm a formulator, so I don't design the chemicals. However, I have seen many presentations at RadTech about different companies working on photo initiators specifically for LED. Next question is, do you have any consistent value supporting LED advantage regarding UV curing efficiency? I'm not sure if that is with respect to formulation efficiency or power consumption efficiency. Um, in terms, Jay can speak to formulation, but in terms of equipment, LED systems are much better at converting electrical energy into a very specific part of the spectrum. And, and they eliminate the wasteful wavelengths that we're not using. So LED diode technology is you know, probably 40, 50% efficient at converting electricity into UV light. And then it comes down to harnessing that UV light within in the formulation. And I don't know, don't know how to answer that question any further unless, Jake, you want to talk about efficiencies and reactions. Uh, just that it, it really depends on the, the formulation itself. So as I mentioned earlier in the slide, the, there are some monomers, oligomers, and, and certainly photoinitiated blends that perform better by LED than they do by mercury, um, or at least the, the monomers and oligomers do. So if the if a formula is designed for LED, 
then it's going to outperform a, a mercury UV formula where the photo initiator package has been pulled out and replaced with an LED uh, formula. Um, next question was, is there a preferred photo initiator for LED work? Uh, I don't think there's any secret in the market that uh, TPO is one of the most common photo initiators for LED. Um, I can say that in many applications, TPO alone will not work. Uh, so beyond that, uh, I can't exactly go into specifics of uh, the formulating for LEDs since that, that, uh, that uh, steps on trade secrets. Um, is there a difference in surface cure with white or black substrate when using LED cure? Uh, not that I have run into at this point. Um, that's not to say that it, it can't happen. But the, the applications I've worked on, I have not seen a significant difference between those two uh, ink types. The, one of the advantages of LED is that you have longer wavelengths at 395 nanometers. So 395 nanometer is not as easily absorbed by, um, you know, by additives, pigments, you know, molecules, dyes within the, the ink coating or adhesive. And so when it hits the substrate, you're hitting the substrate with a lot more energy than you would with mercury, just because you have a, you're starting with a more intense source and it has a longer wavelength that penetrates. So when it hits that substrate, even if a, a black substrate is absorbing more than a white substrate, you're still going to get some reflection back off um, just because of the wavelength range that we're in, and then it cures back. So you, you shouldn't see too big of a difference, um, but there's some advantage with using LED. And the next question is, what is your opinion about the availability of photo initiators on the market? Um, for the last couple of years, things were bad. However, over the last six months, I've seen a significant improvement uh, to the point where it is, is not nearly the issue that it used to be, and most photo initiators are relatively available. Um, the lead times or prices may be higher, but beyond that, uh, you can generally get what you need. There's a question about whether it's, we're going to be sending out a PDF of the presentation. Um, I do know that all of the webinars are archived on the SUNY ESF website, so I'm sure an email will be going out. Um, I don't have any issues with sending um, the, doc, the PDF out, but that's something I guess we'll just discuss after the webinar, and, and if not, people can contact us uh, directly. Just a few more questions um, here. Um, lots of questions on PIs. Jake, do you want to take the next two? <laughs> uh, sure. Will we see LED PIs become more competitive than mercury PIs? Uh, at that point, I'm not sure that, uh, that that's going to be the case just because of uh, mercury PI. The cheapest one out there is benzophenone, but no one seems to like benzophenone because of odor and health concerns. So uh, I'm not sure that. LED photo initiators will come down that low. However, I am seeing uh, now that prices are becoming more stable in the market with the photo initiator supplies improving, the LED photo initiators are coming down. The challenge is that LED photo initiator packages require blends of multiple photo initiators and typically more photo initiator than a mercury system, um, which will still provide a bit of a difference. Um, next one, next question is with Volume growing on PIs. Oh, sorry, that was probably tied to the previous question. Yeah. Um, the next question is, do all or most ink and coating suppliers provide dose at a specific speed requirement for their products? Um, I wish they did. You know, it, it, it's interesting. When we only were dealing with mercury lamps, all of the formulators supplied a dose spec. They would provide or specify the type of bulb and a dose spec, so millijoules per square centimeter. They rarely, if ever, reference the radiance, which is watts per square centimeter. Then LEDs come along, and LEDs were benchmarked by equipment suppliers in terms of a radiance, watts per square centimeter, and wavelength. So everybody just forgot about dose. They forgot about energy density. A properly characterized formulation and a properly characterized LED system includes a wavelength spec, a a radiance spec, so there's an irradiance window, so there's a minimum and maximum. It's not narrow, but there's this window. You need to be able to the minimum. And then there's an energy density or dose spec. And that is the amount of energy you need to cure. And that is a factor of 
that directly contributes to line speed. And so hopefully we'll get to the day where we're all speaking the same language, but unfortunately right now those, those data points are not, not published on, on spec sheets um, or in marketing materials. Um, LEDs typically are mounted much closer to the substrate. Does misting become an issue? So right now with the matrix-style LED system with um, narrow web or sheet bed applications, we're usually mounting that LED system within 10 or 15 millimeters, which is about a quarter, a quarter of an inch to a half an inch. Now, they're emitting less infrared. There's no infrared. So there's less heat transfer. So there's going to be a little bit less, less off-gassing. So it's kind of a combination between the formulation and whether it's um, off-gassing or misting the way you're applying your formulation. That lamp is real close to the web. So whenever you install an LED system on, on press, you, you should start initially by monitoring that lamp emitting window. There's usually a piece of quartz or borosilicate on the front of that lamp. And if you're getting a lot of misting, it's going to deposit on that window. Um, it's usually relatively easy to scrape that missing off. It doesn't bond to the window or adhere to the window. You can usually scrape it off with a tool supplied with the LED system supplier or a razor blade. And the cleaner your application, the cleaner your press, um, that may not be an issue. If you're in a converting facility where the operators and the types of products you apply in the manner that you apply creates more missing, it's going to deposit on that window. So you'll just have to inter implement some sort of a preventative maintenance schedule where you're periodically checking that based on your particular needs. Looks like that's about it for questions. So I want to thank both uh, Jennifer and Jake again for presenting today. This is great. Every time we have a Rad Tech webinar that focuses on LED, it's always a, a, a big turnout. A um, couple reminders, again, the, the archives for the Rad Tech webinar series are on the ESF website. You'll be getting an email shortly after the webinar is over with the link uh, next day or two. The recording will be posted up there. Uh, there's a couple of webinars coming up in this series. The, on the 19th, there's OSHA issues and TC, uh, TSCA related hot topics. But the, there's a companion webinar to this, and Jennifer will be back again. Uh, on UV LED for Wide Web coming up on December 5th. And in that uh, webinar, we're going to delve, or we'll delve a little bit more into how LED systems work, the difference between arc and microwave systems, and a little bit deeper on, on sustainability. Thank you. And then uh, last reminder, remember, Rad Tech 2020 is coming up in March uh, 9th through 11th down in Orlando. Uh, and more info, registrations at radtech2020.com. Um, thank you, everybody, and have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.